Hello, everyone, and welcome to Radical Black Love. Uh, this is the fourth panel discussion presented by the Reclaim Pride Coalition and the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. My name is Greg Newton. I'm the co-founder with my partner, Donnie Jokum, of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. We like to say that we're a government agency for a government that does not yet exist. And we're also known as a queer bookstore. Uh, we are inside the LGBT Community Center, which has been closed for a year, but we are desperately hoping to be able to reopen again soon. And you can check out our upcoming events on our website, bgsqd.com. And you can also check out books on our online store. And we have a special section dedicated to sele a selection of titles uh, from Reclaim Pride Coalition members. And I want to briefly introduce Reclaim Pride Coalition before we get going. The Reclaim Pride Coalition is a New York City-based group of LGBTQIA2S plus activists in alliance with grassroots community groups nationally and internationally. RPC's primary work is organizing the Queer Liberation March, an annual people's protest march without corporate funding, corporate floats, politicians grandstanding, or police involvement. So we thank you very much for joining us tonight, and this video will live on on uh, our various sites, Facebook pages, and YouTube afterwards, so you can share that with people if you like. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to our moderator from Reclaim Pride Coalition, Francesca Barzan. Please give it up for Francesca. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Greg, for helping us put this panel on. I have been a member of the Reclaim Pride Coalition since late 2018 when we started planning our first Queer Liberation March. And I'm ecstatic to be here with all of you um, this year, this past year has been particularly hard for me um, as a black person living in this country. And I feel like what was very important to me when we were trying to decide what panel discussions we should have, I wanted us to also focus on the positive and the joy and the love that I felt from the black LGBTQIA2S plus community. And that's really what this panel is about for me. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm really excited to get started. I would love for each panelist to introduce themselves and just talk a little bit about what Radical Black Love is to you. We can start with Hari. Thank you so much, Francesca, and I'm so happy to be here with all these amazing folks. Um, my name is Hari Ziad. I'm the editor-in-chief of Race Bader, which is a digital publication that is dedicated to issues surrounding race, gender, and sexuality from an abolitionist lens. Um, I'm also the author of a memoir called Black Boy Out of Time that came out earlier this year. Um, and I'm really excited for this conversation because for the book, um, Race Bader, all of my work centers around how to make abolition a world without uh, police and prisons um, possible in our interpersonal lives, I think, um, looking at the ways that we use punishment um, within families and communities and in our neighborhoods um, is, is something that that's, uh, is really important when we're talking about the larger policing structures. And to me, that's what Black love is. And so, um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk more about how Black love and abolition align and, and how that has showed up in, in my life and in my work. Thank you so much, Hari. Uh, Jason, would you like to share? Hi, my name is Jason. Um, I'm a fiction writer and artist living in New York City. Um, I use they, them pronouns. And for me, radical black love, um, I sort of get my definition of love generally from Bell Hooks, her book, All About Love. Um, and she talks a lot about love being about mutual care for one another, support, connection, commitment, trust, and respect. So for me, black, radical Black love is about channeling all of that into my community, the Black community, Black queer folks. It's about you know committing to the Black community, the Black queer community as a whole. And sort of as Hari was saying, like committing to our freedom and liberation. And just as you said, abolition is like at the root of that. So yes, I agree completely with that. 
Thank you so much for that, Jason. I love Bell Hooks' definition of love, and that is one of my favorite books. Uh, Junata, would you like to share? Yeah, um, I think for me, um, radical Black love is a thing that is really saturated in experience and practice and embodiment. It's at this point, I think, in my creative career, um, or I don't know, I, career isn't the right word, but like creative path, you know? Um, I come from a background of like performance and installation, experimental art that's all very saturated in blackness and queerness and liberation and shimmer and spectacle and wildness. Um, for me, like I've been like an activist since I've been a teenager and I know I look like a baby, but I'm about to be 40. And um, I've been like in like resistance in a way that has kind of um, repeated violence, repeated policing, re repeated um, a sense of um, oppression in my body, you know? So I do think like a lot of the work I've been navigating around radical black love has been saturated in the erotic, the erotics of abolition. Like how is it not just kind of like a mental exercise, but a thing that I, practice through like orgasm and laying in nature and like, you know, giving myself um, permission to, um, yeah, just be and follow my natural alignment. Um, I'm based in Minneapolis and um, it's interesting because like obviously Minneapolis has become significant um, due to police violence. And it's been a thing that has been central to my, um, you know, activism work. I've also lived in New York um, and, you know, also was an activist in that space. Um, so I think for me, like at this point, it's like, how do I, you know, in my abolition work locally, in my sort of work as a young adult author, which is like such a wonderful plug to kind of like connect with young people around blackness and queerness and liberation and resistance and abolition. Like, I think for me, radical black love is finding subversive spaces for us to just practice sweetness, you know, for ourselves as Black people. Thank you so much for that. I think we need to be able to, as a people, just be tender with each other and kind to each other because this world is so harsh and difficult to us. So I really appreciate what you just shared. Uh, Jade, could you please share with us? Well, hello everyone. My name is Jade and this is my name sign. That's my name sign because I'm a rock star. <laughs> well, well, really that name sign was given to me by somebody uh, because I never had a name sign. I always think I spelled my name. So it was given to me about six years ago, I believe when I was on tour. I was one of the judges of a music festival. I was a music festival judge and I was the only deaf one. Everybody was hearing. So my responsibility was to judge international film. I'm sorry, with other judges. And I spent time with them for about a full week. And it was there where they, we were hanging out with each other and you know, deaf culture, you have to have a sign name to identify, you know, exactly who you're talking about, you know. So anyways. So what is radical black self-love? For me, it means it's game changing. It's game changing. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was asking for her to lift her hands up higher. What did you miss? What did you miss? Radical Black Love means it's a game, it's game changing for the community, for both deaf and hearing people, but especially for BIPOC, for the BIPOC community. When I see something that's not working or something that's not growing, it, it seems to be stagnant and the same or somebody who's white in the community doing something that's not right or is oppressing us, we do things wrong. So we have to take action and go ahead 
and take over because nobody nobody's doing anything. So you have to be the person to take the lead. And oftentimes there's there's misunderstandings that happen, but for me, the focus has to be on the goal with changing the system. Hollywood is a system, you know, you know how Hollywood is, so but for me, you gotta roll up the sleeves and take action. You're gonna have to do it. You know, you have to so, motivate yourself and just go out and do it, be it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I definitely agree that oftentimes black people have to do what other people won't do and we have to step up in ways that are unbelievable, um, but we continue to do it. And so I appreciate you all for everything that you've done thus far and will continue to do. Anesu, you can go ahead and share. Howdy, everyone. Uh, my name is Anesu and my pronouns in use are he, him, his. I work for the International Trans Fund. Um, we are the only trans-led and trans-centered grant maker in the world whose entire mission is resourcing, supporting, and aiding trans movements across the world. Um, it's really, I'm really happy to work there. And like part of the reason why I work there is what I like a manifestation of what I believe radical black love is. I think radical black love at the center is an action. It's a call to action to, to love one another, to go out of our way to do those things that um, white supremacy and capitalism kind of force us not to. And I think we all kind of spoke a little bit about that in just different ways. And I think for me, it's the collective care. It's the way we show up for each other. It's the way we make sure our bellies and our souls are full and fed. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to be in this conversation. I think even this moment right here is a practice of radical black love. We're all sitting together in our beautiful blackness and in our connection and our difference and connecting about you know, who we are and how we can show up for each other. Thank you all so much for sharing that. Um, so now that we've started off by defining radical black love and just talking about what we, what it is and what we hope to achieve. Well, I wanted to next talk about what do we hope to achieve with radical black love and what are some barriers to achieving it? Um, we can continue to go in order or people can speak up. Um, I'm open to either way. Yeah, I hope that with with the work that you all have so beautifully touched on uh, in explaining what radical black love is, I hope that it allows us to um, understand what healing could be for us in our communities and what's possible um, in terms of another world that's outside of all of the things that our barriers. Um, I think huge barriers, obviously, are all the structural systems that are in place, but also just this ideology that um, you know you can't be in community with another person and 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 heal your harms together. Like you always have to have the state come in as an arbiter of any type of conflict, um, and we don't know how to hold each other accountable without punishing one another or and even ourselves. Like I think that um, also is um, a part of how we view our own selves and our own mistakes. Um, which is a huge part of radical black love is, is learning how to take the punitivity out of the ways that we engage our own selves. Um, and so I think that what's possible when we do that work um, is a world where we're free, which I, I don't even know um, if we can really fully envision that until we start doing this work. Um, but to me, that feels like the moments where I felt the most joy without having to you know, think about you know, who's the latest hashtag on Twitter. Uh, and that has always been in community with other people um, who were committed to, to black love and committed to working through our things together um, and who were coming from a place of like, no matter what harms we do to each other, we're still in this together. Um, and so how do we heal from that together? Um, and so, yeah, I think that is what's possible when, when we, commit to radical black love. Thank you so much for that, Hari. I just want to add a little bit about our punitive nature, I think, as human beings and how sometimes it can be rooted in, like you said, certain systems like religion and different things like that. And I think for me, myself, a big part of achieving radical black love and for myself and for others is understanding 
where we all came from and how much further we have to go. And I think grace is a very big part of that and understanding people are going to mess up. People are going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And it's like, I have to look at myself and consider when are the times that I did those things and when can I allow space to educate or help other people come along so that we can all achieve this radical black love that we speak of. Exactly. And even taking it to the another level of um, thinking of it, not just of like right and wrong, like harm doesn't have to be, um, we don't have to ascribe this idea of it being wrong. It's, it's a product of so many different things, um, which allows us, I think, to do exactly what you're saying when you know, there, it's it's not just this binary of, of good and bad. Um, and we're all complicated beings. We're not, none of us are just completely monsters. None of us are saints. Um, and everything that we do um, has a reason. And so how do we look at the, the ways that that shows up for ourselves, um, which I think allows us to give that grace to other people um, when we can see them as more than just, you know, a, a very flattened idea of good or bad. Right. Uh, would anyone else like to talk about the barriers that exist to achieving radical Black love? So in preparation for this panel, um, I read a great article by Darnell L. Moore. I'm very much a reader, so I will mention all the books I've read in preparation for this. Um, but this is a great article um, where he writes, um, that Black radical love is a practice and it requires constantly unlearning all the harmful things we were taught by society. Things like ableism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, ageism, the list goes on. Um, these are things that are ingrained in us because we live in an anti-Black society. We live in a society that discards people for their differences. And so I think radical Black love and a, like a a barrier to radical black love is the unwillingness for people to unlearn these things and unwillingness for people to break these barriers because they benefit those people in some ways, you know? So um, yeah, I think just unlearning and committing to growth, committing to personal growth and committing to the growth of the people around us um, will help break those barriers. Um, and yeah, I think something, Something else that, um, something I think about often is sort of like, as you were saying, Hari, we all harm, we've all done harm, we all have the capacity to harm. So I really think it's just about committing to minimizing that harm and learning from that harm in the best way that we can. Thank you so much for that, Jason. Would anyone else like to speak on this particular topic? Jade was raising um, their hand at some point, right, Jade? Yeah, yeah, I just have one thing to say. Um, so before I go on, do you mind um, if the interpreter shows up? Because I'm like, I need to see the interpreter to make sure that she's following me. Okay, interpreter's here, thank you. Okay, so, well, what I wanna say, in my experience, when, okay, when you're changing the game, you're changing the system. When I first started in deaf, when I first started Deaf Talent, the movement in 2012, I started that because there wasn't enough visibility. There wasn't enough exposure of, well, black talent, black actors. And, you know, what did we do? We went to the streets. Not in protest, more of like, like as a, as a assembly. As assembly with signs trying to spread awareness that we're here and we want acting jobs. We want to work. And from that time from 2012 up until, you know, we started advertising, we, we tried to change Hollywood, the system we invited, we were invited to tell our story. And then what happened in 2015, white deaf people in the community, what did they do? They took my platform 
well, really ours, but I was the one who started it. They took our platform and shifted it and shifted the focus onto them and all of the white deaf folk. Why did they do that? Well, what had happened was Hollywood. Hollywood wanted to, instead of, instead of using deaf actors, they were using hearing actors. So they were they were upset, you know. So we fought, and our fight and their fight were kind of the same thing. Well, really, we were fighting for the same thing. Wow. We were fighting for the same thing. We wanted visibility. We wanted to work. Yeah. But wow. what with the Black Indigenous people of color, there were there were actors that wanted to act. And what happened was we looked at the white deaf, and they were rolling up. We rolled up our sleeves. We said, No, that's not right. You can't take our voice. You can't do that. And so in theory, they were quote unquote, putting their knees on our necks, trying to silence us. And we were fighting from those, from that time on. And you know what happened? What I did with my radical black love, in order for change to happen, in order for people to take notice, to see that we're not playing. That's, uh, that's our mark. That was our for deaf talent. With an R. With an R. I trademarked it. But, you know, we have to, one of our radical black love for black talent, black deaf talent. Because they wanted to shift. But because the white deaf people wanted to shift focus to them, I had to block them from using my hashtag. If they wanted to use it, they will have to pay for it. Thank you for sharing that, Jade. You bring up a few interesting points. And I think the thing that stands out to me is we want we want visibility, we want representation. And I'm also a writer. And I know the struggle, especially in Hollywood, of trying to get our stories, our stories told. Um, and oftentimes, I think in the LGBTQIA2 plus community, white stories can eclipse all of the rest of us. Um, so I'm curious what you all think about ways to combat that and ways to, to get our story told. Jade, you can go ahead and start this off. Well, I wanted to add that I didn't want to take over too much of the space, but just a short answer, just a bullet point. What I want to share, you know, out of the positives that out of that experience, I wanted to share that, you know, there was change. There was, I was actually waiting for one of the top Hollywood networks to say yes to my TV show. And, and it's based on my actual life, you know, black, being black, being deaf, being queer. I'm sorry, interpreted accent for vacation. And being Jamaican. Um, the TV show is loosely based on my life. The TV show is based um, on my life. Black, queer, Jamaican. So I'm just waiting for that yes. I'm just waiting for that yes. Uh, in network. <laughs> I'm waiting for a yes from the network. Thank you. And I also want to share that another path that a lot of creatives will take is creating their own their YouTube YouTube series and different things like that. Um, I think yeah. networks and things like that are amazing because you have a built-in support in a lot of ways and you can get audiences, I think, faster and more eyeballs on your work. But I do just want to recommend to people watching that there is always a way and you can always make your art and make your work. Um, and that's just something that's very important to me uh, to share with everyone. Does anyone else want to talk about ways to combat um, other members of the community kind of eclipsing our stories or making it more difficult for us to achieve this radical black love. Yeah, I was going to say um, so much of what Jade was saying is resonating with me. I'm also a screenwriter and so um, doing all of this stuff in Hollywood now and realizing, and I think I already knew this, but seeing more firsthand that maybe on that stage, like it's never gonna be possible. <laughs> like this industry is built up specifically to continue to eclipse 
our voices. And so I think in a lot of ways, like the people, and I do this, it's not to point fingers at anyone, but when we're constantly doing things like, you know, showcasing how Oscars are so white and, and trying to shift the, the narrative in those ways, um, I think it opens up a lot of opportunities, but ultimately, um, because the function of this industry is to keep us excluded, they're gonna create new barriers. And so um, I, to your point, uh, Francesca, I think it's really, really important to look at the ways that we've built up our own platforms and not just you know um, the ones that mirror Hollywood, but how we've been telling stories outside of what you've even conceived of as stories. Um, the ways that you know folklore is shared throughout the black community and, and how we've, we've kept so much of our heritage through that in, in ways that you know a lot of academics who study things like that don't even recognize. Like it was Zora Neale Hurston, one of the first uh, anthropologists that really collected how that storytelling moved through our community. And so I think if we could put more of an eye onto the ways that we tell stories, the ways that stories have shaped us, um, and support the people who are our storytellers within our communities. Um, I think ultimately we'll run into barriers with capitalism, like there's only so many resources. But I think the first step is to recognize that it, it is happening and it doesn't always have to happen on their platforms, on their terms. And even if we have to do some work in, you know, in Hollywood or in, you know, the white publishing industry, which is how I had my book, um, to never lose sight of the work that's happening outside of those rooms is really important. Right. I definitely agree with that. And I think that they can be used as a tool the way that they try to use us as a tool to to get people's attention, to get more black eyes on our work. And then we can have things like our, our own websites or our own blogs or different things like that, that really fully say what we want to say, because you can't put, I'm sure we can't put certain things on network TV that we might want to. Um, and so these are just things to consider. Would anyone else like to talk about this or can we move on? Yeah, could I, I just, I really love yeah. what, um, what you're saying, Hari, and I think it, it leads so much towards this idea of decentering whiteness in our work and in our lives. And I think that's kind of the central point of radical black love in a way is to, you know, well, not in the central point, but it, it is a significant piece that we, in our movements, in our love and in our light and with each other, we don't have to focus so much about doing it in contrast, like with like white people or with the systems that are in our lives. It's about each other. It's about that connecting to our stories, connecting to our culture, connecting to our heritage. And that's honestly why I, I love the concept of radical black love, because for me, it's it's a return to like the before. It's a return to before, you know, my country was colonized. It's a return to before, you know, folks were bought, brought over to the U.S. It's a return to each other. I mean, it's a it's an act of like turning inwards, and I think you see that, like you said, in the ways that Black creators are cre um, cultivating their own work that you know doesn't have to exist in this like mainstream. And it's the way that you know we are creating spaces for each other like this. It's the way that we like shift resources to one another. It's it's trying to exist without like looking um, towards you know the this scary thing called white supremacy. It's looking towards the beautiful thing called like blackness and queerness and transness. Thank you so much for that, Inesu. Um, as you were talking, I remember this quote from James Baldwin that goes, it took many years of vomiting up all the filth I'd been taught about myself and half believed before I was able to walk on the earth as though I had a right to be here. And I think for me growing up and not seeing myself represented in media or in positive ways, made it very difficult for me to see myself as being able to be successful as being able to have this radical black love. So I think, a duty for me as a writer is to make sure that the future generations are not believing the filth that this society teaches us about ourselves. And so one thing I also wanted to talk about was imagining our future and how, how we think our future with radical black love would look like. Yeah, I feel like um, we're, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm based in Minneapolis and Minneapolis is a strange place because although there's like a very diverse and like expansive black community, 
Um, there's just still so much um, disenfranchisement, like just baked into the city. Um, and I think like a lot of what has been interesting for me in the last year, we're now coming up on a year of the uh, murder of George Floyd and so much as an activist, obviously, like I've been in the struggle with, you know, these very specific, um, you know, black traumas that have become collective um, national and global traumas. Cause you know, we all know people who have died, you know, um, in these very kind of ways that specifically have to do with like the sick, you know, fantasy and imagination of white supremacy on our black souls, you know. Um, but what has been fascinating is like being in a city um, over the last year where we're really like, you know, getting so close to manifesting um, these visions of living without police, you know. Um, and I think it's been fascinating and, and a lot of the things a lot of y'all have been saying is like you know around like how do we really live in this own like personal embodied decolonization you know like one thing that has happened since um you know um the you know george floyd last year is that a lot of resources came into the twin cities for black organizations which created a lot of tension and drama you know locally um so I think like, you know, I say all that to say is that like, you know, we're in a very sort of like, you know, painful kind of like, you know, Phoenix, you know, precipice moment. I, I pray for our city in the sense that like, you know, we totally have felt so empowered and like lit up in a way. Um, and at the same time, like um, all of you have named, like how do we not reify and recreate these systems because we've all been so saturated in these systems of policing and oppression. So anyway, for me, like I've really been just um, inspired to utilize art, to utilize, you know, um, writing in ways that like poetry, like I have this poem that um, is about like giving the police department to the grandmothers, which I wrote like five years ago. And it's like this kind of like, you know, sweet kind of like, you know, give the police department to the grandmother, they'll make it love temples, give them pensions, give them jaguars, like there wouldn't be precincts, you know what I mean? Like really sort of like, how am I sort of evoking through a spell of poetry something different? Um, so yeah, so I like, I think for me, like I've been just giving myself permission to saturate myself in play and sweetness as a blueprint and a pathway to like getting beyond, you know, all it is that I've known my whole life, which has been to be policed and, you know, police and shame and tra traumatize and project. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it's amazing. And I'm also kind of curious if you can speak to it, the process of like how, since all this money has come into these black organizations and how the police have been given less resources and things like that, how is that going? Like, how are you, how are people experiencing the world in Minneapolis? I think like, you know, one thing that me and a lot of other local black abolitionists have been speaking to is that like, there's been hundreds of years and generations of, you know, establishing all that we've known um, here. Um, and there was like this urgency that like, oh, this money comes in, we're supposed to flip it on a dime and pay out abolition in a city, you know? And yes, there was a lot of ways that consciousness shifted, which to me as like a long-term activist in this movement is like, what? Like we actually talk about defunding the police, like we're actually using the word abolition and not just reform. You know, so there's like things in my imagination that's like wasn't ever conceived of. And I do think like right now there's an emphasis on healing. There's an emphasis on resisting the white supremacist urge for like urgency and like make this happen. But, and how do we acknowledge like a lot of people have named is that, you know, we really have to think of, you know, teaching ourselves transformative and restorative justice, creating um, infrastructure for, um, alternatives that are saturated in divine feminine and queer, you know, like healing ancestral BIPOC, you know, um, energy, you know? Um, 
that for me, like I've really been, at least in my circle of abolitionists, we've been talking about spell work, we've been talking about all kinds of witchiness, you know, because this is long haul work. You know, this is work that we'll be doing until we gray hairs and our coochie. You know what I'm saying? So like if we're not sort of like understanding it in that way and being nice to ourselves and getting massages and, you know, like doing things like that, like, I mean, I've been so underpaid and overworked for so long as an artist and activist. And now, you know, through, you know, having opportunities um, to be resourced as an activist, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get therapy. A lot of us Negroes is getting therapy now. You know what I'm saying? Like, so there's some things that I'm seeing shift on an activist. And I think this is local, like not just local, it's national. Like I feel like black um, freedom fighters are so like unapologetically caring for ourselves in ways that like when I was young, like you did not get clout for taking care of yourself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like now we're like, yeah, like go ahead, we'll take you a bath. No, you know, don't worry about it. Like I'll drop you off some soon. You know what I'm saying? Like it's like, yeah. So I think for me, that's a thing I've been grateful to see even if I, I get that it's gonna be a long haul journey. Yeah, I think, we are all realizing that we need to take care of ourselves to be able to sustain this. Um, and the act of self-preservation is a revolutionary act. It's, it's what we need to do if we're gonna continue to fight for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and running ourselves into the ground isn't gonna make, it's just gonna make people wanna leave the movement. So we have to leave space for people to to understand like yes you're going to go out and march and give to, to mutual aid funds and bail funds and and provide food for different people and do all of these different things but you also need to make space for your mental health you also need to make space for therapy and all these different things um and i think one thing that has been interesting is seeing also the commodification of self-care um and so one thing i wanted to ask everyone was how do we keep the self-care movement um, separate from capitalism so that people don't feel like, oh, I have to go get a mani Teddy to take care of myself. But what if I can't afford that? Like, how can we make space for people to take care of themselves and not feel like it's another burden, it's another capitalist structure that they need to fall under? Go ahead, Jay. Well, really, to be honest with you, Sometimes when when you're I'm by myself or well not on the time when when I find myself alone and really there's a point where I feel exhausted a little burnt out and some people white people deaf white people in the community would label me as the angry black woman or or pissed off or whatever the label is, you know, because I have a, I'm strong, but at the same time, okay. strong is okay. It's okay to be vulnerable moments too. Like if you're strong, it's all right to like cry. So when I close it off, you know, I have to take care of myself. I have to meditate. I have my systems, you know, of self care, you know? So for radical black self love, self care, you know, I go to the gym. I love going. I love working out. It's a must. I work out. I've been working out for 40 years. I play sports. I play basketball, softball. Um, you know, I play sports. So for me, it's a must. Self-care is, ne is a necessity. I teach acting. And, you know, I'm trying to build up momentum to get my show going. You know, I have a, I have a tight friend circle. You know, I have a, a community. In the past, I thought, I oh, don't know, that's nothing. I don't need that. I, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know self care. But now, I, when I'm starting to feel like my limits starting to get reached, I have to, I have to step back, disconnect, and you know, I turn on my mood lighting. You know, I, I spend the environment. You know, it's not. Yeah, it's like a, it's my personal club. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like a lot of those things are things that I also do to 
make sure I'm taking care of myself, therapy, being in community with friends, working out, kickboxing, things like that are all ways that I think we can help our mental health, our physical health, all, all the different parts of ourselves that need to be fed to be able to continue this work. Would anyone else like to share how they are keeping themselves healthy? Go ahead, Jason. Um, I think just resting is so important. And I think it's interesting you said like um, the commodification of self-care because I do feel like a lot of the mainstream self-care movement that I see on like Instagram and Twitter and stuff is still very rooted in capitalism, right? So it's like, if you're feeling burnt out, go take a staycation, take some time off work so you can come back at full percentage and get back into working. And I think sort of divorcing self-care from productivity is a way that we can divorce it from capitalism because I know a lot of people, including myself, who feel like, well, I can't, I didn't do enough today, you know, so I can't relax and watch TV because I didn't do X, Y, and Z. But the reality is like, life is hard enough without having to do anything. So I think you should always feel free to take rest whenever you need to, whenever you want to. And I think even something as simple as taking a nap is self-care, you know? It doesn't always have to be going to the spa or even um, like, I think going to therapy is so important, but it's something, the reality is that a lot of marginalized people cannot afford. And Hari speaks to this in their memoir, Black Boy Out of Time, um, but it's something that we're always so quick to like, oh, you have an issue, that your mental health's down, go to therapy, like, it appears my therapist number, and then it's like, $200 a session, like, who, who, like, who's paying for that, who can, like, realistically pay, like, $200 a session once a week, sometimes bi-weekly, depending on how often you need it, um, so I really think um, we can go even, like, we can go backwards, and, not, like, instead of not necessarily jumping to therapy or jumping to spending money, um, money that we might not have, we can talk to our loved ones, journal, rest, lie down, um, lie in the grass, like just try to be in tune with our bodies, channeling, channeling that sort of self-love in any way we can and understanding that we are free to rest. Even if you didn't do anything, it's okay to rest. It's okay to take a nap. It's okay to care for yourself even if you're not, even if it's not tied to necessarily productivity. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, sleeping is so important. If you can't sleep, you can't heal. And as someone with insomnia, it is extremely difficult to, to get through things when you're not sleeping. Um, it's a basic function that everyone needs to do. And to your point about therapy, in many ways it is a, a privilege um, to have, to find a good therapist, to find someone that can understand and relate to your experience and all these different things. So that is something that we all need to be aware of. I think community care is an important topic. And one thing that I've found extremely helpful in my journey has been um, support discussion groups that were essentially free. We just might have given like a few dollars to cover the space of the room that we were in, but it was people from completely different backgrounds talking about um, bisexuality and, and their journeys to coming out, their journeys um, in the workplace and all these different things. And I think that has immensely helped me. Um, and I just also want to recommend that to people um, because that's, that's something that I think can be very helpful and a low cost option if you're not able to afford one-on-one um, -on -one therapy. So does anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Yeah, all of this is hitting so close to home. Like, um, especially thinking about rest, I've been really fascinated with that concept recently, mostly because I haven't been resting. But even when I'm like thinking about rest, I usually am thinking about it within the context of, okay, I need to be rested so that I can do more work, which is like this whole self-defeating thing that you all are talking about. Um, and this conversation really illuminates how I need to, work to reframe that um, and to keep that at top of mind. But I've also loved, Junata, that you brought up um, spell work and ancestral work. I think for, to your question earlier about how do you prevent this um, self-care from being commodified, it's 
Um, you can't commodify the ancestors. Like everybody has their unique relationship, their own relationship to their ancestors. Um, you can buy some things that might help you along, like different roots or whatever, but it's always going to be rooted in your own relationship to your people. And so for me, I know that it's really, really important to center all of my care work with the work that I'm doing with my ancestors. And that also helps when I'm doing things like questioning, you know, what I need to rest and I can ask my grandmother or somebody and they can tell, give me that message directly in a way that I wouldn't necessarily be able to get anywhere else, even in therapy. I think um, ancestor work is, a, is very good to pair with therapy if you need to do that. Um, but it's its own unique thing that can't be commodified that you can do on your own. Um, and that at, at its core is community communal work. Like you're connecting to your people, you're connecting to the people that brought you here. Um, and those are the people that are gonna heal you even if they're not here anymore. Um, and so for me, that's how I think that we get over that hump of like commodification of self cares by rooting it in the ancestor work that we're doing. Thank you for sharing that, Hari. I think for some people, the idea of ancestor work might be new. So I would love to hear a little bit more what you mean by that and also what you mean you meant by that, Janata. Yeah, so I set up my altar a couple of years ago um, when I was, started writing the book and I was just thinking about my relationship to my grandmother who passed away. Um, and in therapy, we started talking about inner child work and like um, how you can still connect to the parts of yourself that you might think are lost and how that can be helpful with working through childhood traumas. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is kind of how ancestor work could work. Like you can still connect to the parts of you um, that you might think are lost, if, even if they're like a person, like your grandmother. Um, and so I set up the altar and um, it's really, just me spending time in this space that is um, is is curated to to give you the energy of your people, um, and so in the same way that you might do inner child work, you're actually communicating with an externalized uh, idea of this energy and just waiting to hear what the messages that your body and your mind tell you um, back, and that's just one expression of ancestor work particularly altar work, but that's I think central to ancestor work is realizing that your people are always talking to you. When you get that intuition that something is off, that's them when a random thought crosses your mind. And so it really helps you to pay attention to that. And I think a way that living in this colonialist society, we're taught to ignore, um, like everything has to have a very specific purpose and it has to be productive in a very specific way. Um, an ancestor where it kind of removes all of that and uh, reminds us that um, we're always connected to to the people that we came from. They'll always be a part of us and they'll always be communicating with us. Um, and so they're obviously gonna be very central to our healing journey. Um, and so after my mother passed away, I had her to the altar and that's how I stay in touch with her. Um, and yeah, it's been hand in hand with the work that I've been doing in therapy, with like working through anxiety things. Um, so much of my anxiety is like my mind has been taught to think about something in one way. And so I'm like just beating myself up about something that I know I shouldn't be worrying about. Um, and then like doing ultra work, I can listen to that part of me that's like, no, like you don't have to worry about that. Um, and so it's been really, really helpful in that, that way. Um, I know Janata probably has a lot to add about their journey. Um, yeah, I think like um, kind of thinking about the inner child, I really have been thinking about like from a young age, I have been in communication with the ancestors before I was very cognizant of it. And I think also as far as movement work is concerned, like, you know, we've always had like a deeply entrenched spiritual, you know, aspect to our work as black freedom fighters, wherever we are globally. Both my parents are from the Caribbean. So like a lot of even sort of me understanding myself as of lately has been and connecting to ancestors and ancestral energy and knowledge that due to the migration and immigration experience of my parents, um, was just inherently like cut off. Um, 
And I think like I've been fortunate like over the years to come across so many, you know, beautiful, you know, sort of mystic black people who um, have other ways of connecting to spirit besides, you know, um, kind of the Christian lens that a lot of um, black folks, um, you know, had access to or were forced to, you know, kind of um, specify their spirit work in. And I like came from parents who were both really like kind of questioning like Caribbean mystics, you know, in the 70s during the Rasta movement, which had a lot of, you know, aspects of you know, returning to Africa, of living off the land. Um, so I think for me right now, and actually in my in um, the book that I um, wrote, my young adult book, a lot of it is like, how do you create a technology of spirituality that makes sense for you as a black person, you know, including like, you know, things, ways of connecting to your ancestors. Like I have been doing astrology and tarot since I've been a teenager. And like, now I've really been affirming myself like, oh yeah, like that's a part of my movement work. Like, I think I used to see it as compartmentalized, but I think in this season of my life, y'all will hear me a lot. I'm about to be 40. So I'm like, that's like a big deal for me. Um, but like, it is sort of this thing where I'm like, wow, like this is who I've been for so long. Like this is a cohesive coherent way of doing things. And I think for so long as an activist and like an artist, it's like I was waiting for this moment where I felt like I was doing it right. And I think like a lot of what, you know, sort of my encouragement with young people and like other black and queer folks is to just trust our intuition to kind of like flow and be fluid. And that's how our ancestors were with um, the spiritual practices. Um, but yeah, like as far as ancestral thing, like, yeah, totally. Like I, I'm always talking to my grandma. I'm always talking to my great, my um, god aunt, um, god aunt, my godmother, who's my aunt who died when I was young. That was like my first real ancestor who I connected to. So yeah, so I just feel like I just give people permission to like in your journey, like treat it like you're talking to, you know, them on the phone, like, you know, hey, you know what I mean? I used to feel like as a kid, I had to do like all of this stuff. And it's cool if that's your thing. Like if you're a Libra moon or something like me, like you need crystals, you need like all these vibes, but like know that like your ancestors are listening to you if you just walking down the street, like hearing a bird sing pretty, you know, and I, a lot of y'all reference that. So, you know, just listening and trusting it because I think we're also taught to always second guess and that what we're doing is evil if it ain't got something to do with this very specific thing. And I think a lot of us is just decolonizing it and getting connected to something more um, like tender and sensuous and, you know, accessible. Thank you so much. Um, both of you really gave me a lot to think about. And I think growing up Christian with Haitian parents, I'm, I've become very interested in Haitian voodoo and how those things relate to spirituality and different things like that. But having family that says, no, that's not okay, or that's evil can be discouraging. I think for a lot of black people to wanting to figure out their, the spirituality of these Caribbean nations and then also going further back to Africa. So I think it's really important to hear both of you talk about what ancestor work is, how how we can practice it, and also just encouraging young people to, to learn for themselves and not feel entrenched in, in what they were taught growing up. So thank you both so much. Yeah, and a great podcast, if you're like interested in starting a new journey with the altars is a little juju podcast is amazing. I've learned a lot. And also Hoodoo Plant Mamas, if anyone is interested in learning more, both are by um, people who, you know, have, you know, were not raised with hoodoo and, and came to it. And so they speak a lot to what that transition looks like and all of the fears that you might have. I mean, we've been taught that connecting to our ancestors is demonic and like unrooting that is going to take a lot of work, but they do a really great job of that. Thank you so much. Um, so I kind of want to shift the conversation and just talk a little bit about um, transformative justice, because I think transformative justice is very important for how we will one day achieve black, ra to achieve radical black love. And I would just like to ask y'all, how were you able to perform transformative justice when we were raised in this very punitive society?
I guess I, oh, I guess I could speak a little bit. Um, I think one thing that's been important for me in my journey is understanding that, like, as much as I know the punitive like nature, it's also I don't know that much about what it means to be an abolitionist, and that can seem like a challenge point. Like, it seem like a place to turn away and say, well, it, it is easier to rely on like the punitive measures that we've been taught in our society. Or I could take this and take the experiences I have with others as an opportunity to grow, as a lifelong lesson of like, how can I challenge myself and how can I challenge the people that I interact with to like lean into the, the gritty and the messy of, real, of our lives, which is that we do harm each other very regularly, very consistently. We aren't necessarily given the tools from an early age to like work through that harm, whether it's like, you know, something people would consider super serious or something not. And I think that's what's been most exciting to me about transformative justice and like the ideas that I'm seeing like in books and just in the mainstream conversation is like, you can learn, you can fumble through like the messiness of existence um, and like learn how to be a better person and learn how to love each other. Cause that's the point, right? We're not put on this earth as perfect beings. We're definitely not like perfect with the systems that we come in contact with. So I don't, I don't take it as a as a daunting um, or an emotionally um, scary thing. I take it as like an opportunity just to connect with each other in a healthier way, so that we can then like actualize the actual future we want. Like we're not going to get to liberation unless we get through this, unless we like struggle towards our messiness and towards our connection. I definitely agree with that. Thank you for sharing. Would anyone else like to talk about how they're able to perform transformative justice or? even share an example of maybe a scenario or something that could give other people maybe a framework or an understanding of, of transformative justice. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you, a, a good framework is just, you know, the, even in like my relationship with my partner, right? Like if he does something that I don't like, um, whether I respond out of a need to want to hurt him versus a need to like actually ameliorate and solve the problem. Even if he's done something harmful, it's very different to be able to address that harm and hold that him accountable versus just trying to hurt that person back. And that's the difference I think between um, a punitive way of moving out the world and one that is rooted in transformative justice. And I think what's hard for a lot of people to, to, to make that step from the interpersonal, I think it's easier to see how that works like within a, with a partner, um, is that sometimes we see, uh, uh, we, we say um, something's not punitive and we think that um, that means that there's no consequences, that means that um, it's just completely nonviolent. I don't think that um, a world without police, a world without punitivity is going to be inherently nonviolent. I think, you know, some buildings need to be burned down. Some people need to get slapped. Um, but the difference is that when you're doing those things, when, we, when people are marching down to the precinct and burning that building down, they're not doing that just to punish necessarily the people inside of that. They're doing that to transform the community. And so I think you can approach that, um, use that approach in all of your uh, your your interpersonal relationships um, with your neighbors. You know, what do you do when your neighbor is doing something that you don't like? Um, how do you approach that without wanting to, to punish them, make it harder for them to live next to you, but to actually work that thing out together um, with your family? I mean, my book is about my relationship with my mother and um, who was very queer phobic and um, a lot of my, uh, before she passed, what we had to work through is how do I hold her accountable for that while also healing this relationship? And so it's hard work, it's very difficult. Uh, it means going back to our earlier point of seeing people as whole people, like people who are capable of harm and they're also capable of being loved at the same time um, and actually putting in the work to do that. Um, and yeah, so so I, I, I don't think it's the same, it's not one size fits all, it's gonna look different in every relationship. Um, but if you're just approaching that relationship with the standpoint of like, I can do something to heal this versus I can do something to create further harm on the person that harmed me, then I think we can move closer towards 
uh, a world where we're not just moving based on punitivity. Thank you so much. I think that is really important. And I think one thing that is essential for transformative justice is honesty, honesty with ourselves and honesty with others. And I think it can be very difficult to be honest about why we're doing things. I think for myself personally, growing up, it could be easy to either deny or avoid certain feelings because they are so difficult. So I would just encourage people to really sit with why they do things how they're doing them. Um, what helps me a lot to figure out those, the answers to those questions is journaling, is thinking, why did I do that? And just thinking back to, I guess it, it's, I've never thought about it as inner child work, but I think about the way that I was raised and how those things impact the way I see the world today. Um, and so I just think that's some very important work that we all need to be doing to achieve radical black love. Would anyone else like to talk about this topic specifically? Um, yeah, I'm just echoing all of Hari's points. And um, I would say I'm relatively new to transformative justice myself. So a book that I read um, in a book club with a bunch of friends um, was called Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. And I think that really helped me sort of reframe my thinking and um, really um, trying to understand the ways in which I can represent I might replicate like punitive thinking and how to unlearn that. So I think that was a great resource for me as a beginner. Um, and yeah, just as Howard was saying, it's really about healing and really about choosing to do the work of healing. And I think um, you mentioned like your relationship with your mother and I feel that so hard. Um, my mother has also like queer phobic tendencies and sometimes it's hard to want to get to a place where it's like I have to I want to educate her but um it's also a lot of work to do that and it can be painful so it's sort of about thinking about like how important that relationship is to me and how much healing I want to do and if she's willing to do that healing as well so as you said it is different with everyone but it's really just about all that at the end of the day and that's why ancestor work is so important too, because some of that can only happen when they're not here anymore. Um, there are some relationships that can only be healed afterwards. And um, knowing that it's still possible to do that, I think takes a lot of pressure off of us from trying to you know, always be in spaces with someone who might be toxic to us. But yeah, I think everything that you're saying is spot on. Thank you so much. Um, since you've been talking a little bit about family and some of the difficulties of those relationships, I think an aspect of radical black love that's been very important for me has been chosen family and how we find the people that we needed, you know, growing up or just in our everyday lives through community, through different spaces, like the um, bisexual discussion group that I used to attend um, by request in New York City was a community that I felt seen in and I felt supported and heard through. And I think there are lots of different types of chosen family and communities. So I would love to hear about people's experiences with chosen family and how that has helped carry you through. I think Jade wanted to repeat that question. Is that correct? How has, how has your experience with chosen families been? Um, how has that carried you through in life and just made it easier for you to exist? Um, I think for me, like I come from a really big family, um, a family of a lot of, um, and I'm a middle child and a lot of personalities and I've always been queer, you know, obviously. And I think um, I always felt like I didn't belong in a lot of ways in my family. And I think a lot of queer folks do. Um, and I think like, I've just been so fucking honored to be queer in this lifetime. Like I pray every lifetime, bring me back queer, yo, bring me back. I love this family, you know? and. I do think it's been interesting in thinking about chosen family, both in you know the people that have really affirmed me and all of my juiciness and complexity, and um, 
in only ways that queer fam can. And as a person that I'm married um, and my wife and I, you know, um, we have a little one and it's like, how are we defining queer family in both of these multiple spaces, you know? Um, and, you know, my wife is Cameroonian and I'm Caribbean and there's a lot of ways that family is super important to us. And at the same time, we've had to navigate you know, like how do we bring all of the things that shaped us that we love about our culture and not sort of define the ways that even, you know, if we may not have seen or understood queerness within the cultural landscape that we grew up in, doesn't mean that queerness didn't exist within it, if that makes sense. And like really chosen family for me at this time is like, how do I find like other, you know, like on this call, I found other queer Caribbean folks through writing my book and like having a queer Caribbean diaspora book, I've met so many queer Caribbean folks that have added another dimension. My wife, you know, um, you know, grew up, you know, not really knowing any queer Africans and for a long time in her life didn't know. And now there's all of these amazing like queer global African networks that are being like, yo, we're here. So I think it's been fascinating seeing queerness as a chosen family, but also seeing like black diaspora continental queerness as like another layer. And a lot of it is like this reclaiming kind of on an ancestral level, you know, um, you know, our, you know, African and queer diaspora queerness that like a lot of ways colonialism and white supremacy has erased from us to the point where people don't even think that queerness existed before this moment in some of um, our communities. So. For me, that has been really sort of like my exciting adventure is just being like kind of um, reclaiming in my like ancestral imagination and also, you know, my cultural imagination queerness amongst us as black folks. Thank you. I, it's interesting you said um, how people think that queerness didn't exist either in Africa or the Caribbean. And I remember, I think growing up thinking queerness was a white people thing. Like, I think that is a very, an idea that I had. And so it makes it hard for you to see yourself in that when that's an idea that people perpetuate. And so I think for me, telling queer black stories is very important and telling them in the Caribbean and telling them in Africa, it's like, what are those people's experiences and how are they finding ways to survive? Um, I think that's extremely important to me. Um, and also another thing that I find very helpful is just, seeing queer black people be married and happy and have children and families. I think one thing that I um, also organized when I was in New York City was um, a day where um, fam like LGBT families would come together and bring their kids. And that was my favorite volunteer thing that I ever did because it's just like, I just get to see these families be happy and just as normal as anybody else. And I get to look forward to having that in my future. And I think we need to also be hopeful and joyful um, to be able to sustain ourselves. Would anyone else like to add anything? Yeah, so I wanna to respond to that question about how my experiences with my chosen family has been and, and how has it supported me in like existing well, yes and no, it's helped. Uh, the reason being because first, well, well, I'm in the Jamaican community. I'm from Jamaica and I'm the only deaf. I'm the only deaf one in my family. I want to say that my family. But I want to say that my family makes me who I am. I, I am who I am because of them. My parents were self-made people. You know, they didn't go to college. You know, I watched them work hard to, to make sure that all six of us had, I'm the fifth born, I'm the fifth child, to make sure that we had like- Ready, fun. No, go on, boy, go on, boy, go on, boy. <laughs> it was girl, boy, girl, boy, that was the order. So there was just as much as one of the other. My big brother was the last born. Half are here in New York and the other half are in Florida. And some are in Jamaica and some are in Canada and Paris. But 
Well, when I found out that my cousins were gay in Canada, I, I had never known that. I thought I was the only gay one and the only self-made one. And I, I stayed quiet about it. I kept it to myself. And when I came out to my parents, I was in my 30s. And it, I was at the gym. Body told the fitness. Gym Body told the fitness. fitness. I was then one day I was watching uh, Sheer, um, uh, Sunny, you know, uh, Family Outing, the book called Family Outing by Cher. You know the book called Family Outing by Cher? What's the, uh, not Sunny, Cher and Sunny's, um, Cher and Sunny's daughter. Son. You Son. Know what I'm about? You know who I'm talking about? What's that? What's that name? Is it Chaz? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank you. Chaz. Okay, got it. Yeah. I, I was watching that that show, and um, they were on Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. I was watching that show. So I was inspiring, you know. And then one day, I decided I, I have to um, call my parents. I have to come out with my parents. I don't know why at that moment. And I, I, after I walk out, I went home, and I call uh, to the relay. We didn't have a fear of us at that time. It was we didn't have at time. We had to do uh, it. So I, I, I decided to call my parents and the relay, you know, um, respond. I, I told them to please um, ask my parents to pick up the phone and somebody to share, you know, somebody to, to tell them, you know. And I, and I said, Mommy, Dad, you know, I, I, I love you. you. You're great. And um, you made me who I am. And I graduate, I'm doing things with my life, I'm happy, and I want to tell you that I'm gay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a mom that I start speaking in tongues. Oh! <laughs> my mom started crying, my dad started crying. But for me, I felt a huge relief. I felt good because I've been lying and hiding. Every time I visit, I'm in Florida. You know, I was always lying and hiding. I want to go out, be with my friend. I didn't like that feeling anymore. I just said, I'm gay. You know, and it's up to them to deal with it. But it took them a long time for them to, you know, accept it. What they're talking about, you know. But sometimes when I would visit my, my parents, I would bring some gold. <laughs> no. I, it was so weird because I never talk about it. We never talk about it, you know. And then one, one day I visit home and my mom said, it's not said because I would say, this is my friend, right? But then when I went home and my mom said, where's your girlfriend? I was like, what? What do you say? She said, girlfriend. <laughs> so wow, I was shocked. And then we couldn't, we couldn't stay in the same room. <laughs> So this is my parents' house now to respect them. But I love my parents and they are really good. They're over 80 and um it's been an amazing journey and growing up it was really hard. Being really hard. You know, going to church, they were forced to go to church, forced me to wear a dress. Oh, I hate wearing a dress. <laughs> and did you have a better experience with chosen did you have a good experience with chosen family? Yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was always hard growing up, you know. Yeah. And um, they don't really learn to sign. That's it. They still don't know how to sign. But mm -hmm. three, you know, they look at me and stuff like that. But um, I, I want to thank my dad because my my dad found the school for the dead because um. When we, when we moved here, and I was going to the wrong school, you know, and they didn't understand what was happening. They thought that I was slow or went to the you know, went to the shadow, whatever it is. And then my dad met um, a wealthy man in the hospital, you know, where they were, and he told my dad about this school for the deaf, you know. Then finally put me out of the other school and put me in the school for the deaf. And then that's where I find myself, and you know, I'll meet my peer, start doing the sports, and you know, it's not for that. 
not for my dad. I don't know where my life would be. I wouldn't be a filmmaker, you know, telling my stories, you know. Thank you for sharing that. I want to ask everyone this question. Um, what are some ways that we can support each other on our path to radical black love? Hari, do you want to start? Um, that's a great, great question. Um, I think by doing this, by, you know, communing with each other, um, we all talked about how love is a practice, right? It doesn't just happen. And so I think we have to like actively create space to carve out what that looks like. Um, and it changes too. I think love is, uh, like I said, it's, it's never going to be the same in every situation. So we have to revisit it. And I think uh, making that time to talk about what it looks like for us, to talk about how you can best receive love from that person, um, and being really intentional about it and practicing it every day, waking up every day and being like, I'm going to be more loving to my partner, to my community, to my family, um, is the best way to support everybody else to in being more loving as well. So, um, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I would do to support. <laughs> Jason, do you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, just all of that. And also just, yeah, it's different for everybody. Um, but I think just being there for one another in any way that we can. So I know we mentioned um, mutual aid funds, supporting our loved ones in our community financially, feeding folks. That's a big one for me. <laughs> Good food. Um, you know, doing the dishes um, when your partner or housemate is tired, just finding ways to support each other, whether small or large, you know, in any way that we can show up for other people. Um, I'm, I'm also a middle child, but I'm the oldest, like, I'm the oldest non-male child, um, so acts of service is my love language. So doing things for people is the thing that I will always do. I'm a huge advocate for that. But something like spending quality time with your loved one, you know, hugging if they're into that, just anything that makes life easier for people because this we live in an anti-Black society. Anything that can ease that, anything that can make that easier. I think is how we support each other and practice black, radical black love. Thank you, Jason. I definitely think it's important that we do things for each other to just make this world easier and better. And I think that honestly starts with kindness and just thinking about what we say to each other. I think sometimes people can be harsh or catty. And I, I know part of the black tradition sometimes can be to shade or roast each other, but it's like, we have to think about where things are coming from and, and just what we're really saying sometimes, because we never know what people are truly going through and how what we say can hit them one day that might not have hit them that same way another day. Um, and so I really appreciate what you shared. Janata? Mm. Yeah, I think um, for me, the word that came for me was receive. And I think like black folks, like, I don't know, like I, I think part of the way that I really kind of have been supporting my community is like teaching folks how to receive and teaching myself to receive. Like, I think I've grew up seeing my, um, my mother and, you know, particularly women in my family not receiving because receiving always felt like it added some sort of burden of debt to you, like, or what have you, you know? And I realized that's a thing that I'd internalize, like not knowing how to like receive sweetness, you know, whether it's from somebody else or even from myself, like, and it's been interesting cause like, you know, my mom is 60 something now and she became a mom as a teenager. And um, I think like right now I'm seeing her be a teenager and ask herself, well, what do I want to do? You know, like today. And I think that's a lot of what I feel like blackness is like our time is so ordered and our imagination for our lives so um, prescribed to us that a lot of, you know, practicing this radical black love for ourselves is like, how do we have an imagination where nobody's like structuring our time and telling us what and who and how we should be? Um, so I think like for me, I've really been like teaching myself to receive 
and really, you know, encouraging people like, yo, receive that. Like, oh, someone want to be nice to you? Oh, someone want to do that thing for you? Receive it, you know? Um, so that's like just been like a meditation, I think, for Black people right now, because I do think we've been so tricked, bamboozled, hoodwinked, led astray. Um, that like, you know, whenever, you know, something good is happening, like I, even like in life right now, I'm not struggling. Like I've struggled my whole life, all my, my whole family, all my life. I, you know what I'm saying? Everybody. And really I have to tell myself like Janata, like don't feel afraid that like something is going to happen because something good is happening. You know what I mean? Like, don't feel like, oh, like, gosh, if, you know, uh, you know, I, so I think that's really been like, you know, sort of how I want, I've just been supporting folks. It's like, y'all receive and we deserve it. And it's not going to go back to evil and whackness. And, you know, not saying that, you know, we don't have to be vigilant, but we don't have to be vigilant in a way where we don't trust sweetness, you know? So that's been my own work, you know, obviously. So. Thank you. I definitely receive that message because I struggle with, like, for example, if someone gives me a gift, I then feel up like uh, an obligation or, oh, I have to immediately return the favor or seeing things in a very transactional way when it's like, they just did something nice for me. They meant it. I don't have to feel this pressure, I think, to, to immediately do something back. Um, and I think that what you said about seeing a lot of women not receive things is something that I also internalize because I remember growing up seeing like my aunt, for example, give up that piece of chicken so everyone else could eat. And so it's like, something that I also think is interesting though is she didn't ever ask if anybody else would give it up. And so I think we have to be aware that we shouldn't make martyrs out of ourselves because I think that can also breed resentment and people will then say, but nobody asked you to do that. And I think we have to be honest about why we're doing those things. Because sometimes I think, at least I have gotten pleasure of being able to say, well, I did this, 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 and this for you. So I think if it wasn't coming from a genuine place, you shouldn't have done it, or I shouldn't have done it. So I just want to put that out into the space as well as something for people to consider. Don't give to the point of resentment, essentially. Um, Jade, would you like to answer? No. <laughs> well, I mean, can you repeat the question? Or, um, final, yeah. final set. Essentially, my question was what are but some ways that we can support each other as we try to achieve our mission? Time I give people money when they need it. Support their all or um their work and you know, uh watch their work if they find me and I try to make time, you know. But the time where I need to my time. <laughs> <laughs> um if they need me to do something, you know, I'm there and um uh, but I teach acting, you know. Every month, and sometimes I offer mentorship programs, you know, for those who need it. Uh, I believe in supporting and giving back to the community. I think that's very important, you know, it's a important part of our, you know, so we can work on that, you know, and to the doing that, you know, give back to the community. Thank you so much for that, Jane. And Anessa? Yeah, um, I just want to say I really love like everything that y'all are saying. I've just been like taking so many notes just about the ways that you all speak and share. So I just, just want to say that. Um, I think for me, it's like the, the double E of like effort and embrace. I think that we can work and hard to love each other and to put ourselves out there for each other, to not close ourselves off, to put in the work of showing up like in the difficult moments and in the beautiful moments. Um, I think that's like that effort that um, like a piece of like what love is described as like by bell hooks, right? Is that you, it's a little bit of work, it's actionable. And I think we're all like talking about different ways that you put in that effort. And I think on the other side, it's embrace, right? It's 
part of the reason we're working so hard to love each other and to support each other is because we want that ultimate embrace. We want, you know, the physical embrace, the emotional embrace and the community embrace. And I think that, um, you know, that means like looking in yourself, looking at your inner child, right? We've, I think a lot of people spoke about that, about embracing like the ways that you weren't taught to love yourself, the ways that you weren't taught to love your community, the ways that you weren't taught to be um, fully in yourself. And embracing that kid and saying like, here you are now in your beautiful queerness and your transness and your blackness, you deserve to be embraced by others. And I think seeing that in other people too, when it's really hard sometimes, you know, when you're in those fights with your partner or when you're in those, you know, accountability sessions when someone's harmed, it's embracing their inner child who's caused them to act that way and embracing their, who they are then too, um, that's causing them to act that way. And so I, I think for me, that's, the way that I find that people have supported me in my own radical path to like love and the way that I want to support each other is, you know, if we can give each other effort and that sweet embrace, you know, I think that's how we'll get to like our liberatory future. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything that you said. Um, we are about to wrap up, but the last question I would like each of you to answer is what's one piece of advice you would give to a younger version of yourself? Um, just to help those out there struggling with how to navigate this world and how to achieve radical black love. Yeah, I would just say you don't have to change yourself for the world. I mean, in so many ways we do because this is a capitalist society, but I think um, at your core, you can still hold on to the things that make you you. And anyone who tells you that you can't um you can you should find your distance from them um in so many words that's basically the book that i wrote but <laughs> and i can't wait to read it thank you so much for that uh jason uh probably something similar um that you don't have to shrink yourself you don't have to alter who you are you don't have to hide the parts of yourself that you think other people will judge um try not to worry about what other people are thinking about you and try to just be as authentically you as you can be. Thank you so much for that. Junata? Um, yeah, this is like what we would speak to our younger self about, that advice you said. Um, I would say come out earlier, first off, <laughs> and go out here, you know what I'm saying? Hold yourself out as much as possible. Um, yeah, and just like be in love with myself. I feel like, you know, coming to, I feel like I'm at like my second adolescence, you know, turning 40. And <laughs> I really just feel like, wow, like what would it have felt like to feel this like in my body and skin in a way that um, I do now as a teenager. And I think that's been like a lot of my activism work as a young adult author is like, how do I give young people permission to just love on themselves just as they are and be curious about the levels of you know themselves just as they are so that's what i would tell myself be like girl let's go to the park we're gonna talk all about it and get you right thank you i appreciate that um jade for me okay little jade it's okay not to wait for permission Go get it. Go after your dream. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it? Yeah. Um, I think I'd say that uh, who you are right now is perfect. If you never changed or never transitioned or never did anything, you're perfect as you are and you deserve all the love. Um, Thank you. Um, and I think the thing that I would tell my younger self is that no matter how bad it gets, you always find a way through with love and with community. You you always find your way out of your darkest moments. And so to me, that is what radical black love is. It saves me and it has saved so many people that I love. And so that is what I wanna leave everyone in this space with. Thank you all so, so much. I can't wait to talk more in the future. Thank you again for your time. Sweet. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you to all the panelists. This was really lovely and encouraging and celebratory. 
and I feel full uh, in a good way. I want to remind you that we have books by Junata and by Hari that are on our online bookstore. So please check out that Reclaim Pride Coalition recommend section at the bgsqd.com slash store. And I hope we will see you all in the physical bookstore, let's say in this year. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> I hope that happens. And uh, have a lovely night, everyone. Um, our next panel, I think, is going to be June 4th. That's going to be on sex work, sex worker liberation. Um, so stay tuned. We'll make an announcement about that once that's finalized. And then after that, we'll see you at the Queer Liberation March on June 27th. Looking forward to it. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Lots of love.